Hey folks, it's Patriot Nurse. In today's segment, I want to discuss with you survival medicine reality checks. What do we need to understand about disasters and their implications for people who are prepping medically? So my background is, of course, being a nurse. I have different disciplines under my belt, and I also have studied pretty extensively modern history in as far as medical disasters go. And there's a few common patterns and themes that you're going to see. And you can put this to the test throughout recent history, you know, going back, honestly, for the past few hundred years when it comes to medical issues. The three things that you need to look for situation-wise in disasters, medically speaking, are the following. Number one, normal medical infrastructure is degraded or non-existent. Number two, household medical supplies are scarce. And three, medical knowledge is limited. I'll repeat that again. You may want to write that down. I told my students to write this down in class too. Number one, normal medical infrastructure is degraded or non-existent. Number two, household medical supplies are scarce. And three, medical knowledge is limited. Now, I'll put this to the test here using our recent, probably most in recent memory, major disaster in the United States, and that's Hurricane Katrina. When we consider the medical situation in New Orleans, in South Mississippi, during Hurricanes Katrina and Rita, there were a few things. Number one, that medical infrastructure, was it degraded or non-existent? Well, ask yourself this. Did we have, in New Orleans and South Mississippi, did we have physical hospitals present? Did we have infrastructure where people historically had gone to receive medical treatment and medical care? Yes, we did. Was it operating at its standard level of efficiency, standard level of you know performance-wise with staffing issues, etc.? Absolutely not. No, it was most definitely degraded. Um, we can also look to you know other situations across the globe. For instance, when I was doing short-term uh, medical missions in the Indo-Chinese Peninsula, we basically the group I was working with had to improvise and make our own medical treatment place. I mean, did we have a physical location where some medicine sporadically had been administered at some point? Yeah, we did. But when you consider that we didn't have hardly any medical supplies that we were used to, we didn't have the standard things we were used to, we basically had to, from the ground up, build it with what we had. Now let's go to the second point here. Household medical supplies are scarce. I'm going to ask you a question. As a percentage of the population, how many people would you say, just in the United States alone, have two weeks worth of, not medicine, food in their house? Two weeks worth of food. And why am I asking about food? Because we are regularly reminded of our need to eat. Well, that's at least a couple times a day, three times a day, or about five if you're in the United States. <laughs> if you're a hobbit, it's like seven times. Um, we're regularly reminded of our need to eat, and yet a great percentage of the population still does not have food stored. How much less so medicine? If you know people like I know people, probably the majority of your friends, if they have any sort of medical supplies stored up, it is most likely a half-empty pink bottle of penicillin, or amoxicillin in this case, you know, from their kid's last ear infection. A $20 kit from Wally World with about 70,000 band-aids, one roll of gauze, maybe a couple tubes of neosporin, and one tiny little petroleum dressing for a burn. Not a whole lot, okay? Now, when you consider, when you consider that in a grid down, in any sort of disaster, you can expect supply line disruptions. You can expect disruptions in the grid, in transportation, in logistical um, implementation, that gets magnified because people are used to being able to take a trip down to the pharmacy. They're used to being able to take a trip to the store to pick up whatever they need within approximately 24 hours. You know, if you can't get to a 24-hour pharmacy that night, we can go to Wally World the next morning, whatever the case may be. In a grid down, you're not going to have that. It's not going to be there. The cows in the background agree. In a grid down, you're looking at not only short availability in the supply line as a whole, in, in pharmacies, in drugstores, but you're also looking at people essentially having to rely upon 
the medical supplies that they have stored in their own house, the meager amount of medical supplies, and it's not a whole lot. The third, the third point in this equation is that medical knowledge is limited. And this is a multifaceted point because medical knowledge is more than just the hard copy knowledge that we have in books, but it's also the availability of soft copy online. Moreover, medical knowledge also consists in your, in your human factors. We also have a shortage in many cases of skilled, qualified, trained personnel. I expect this. I expect that, especially when you're looking at cases of anarchy, of government-organized oppression against the populace, um, governments that are systematically terrorizing minority groups, when you're looking at cases like this, you start to see that even in the lead up to disasters, qualified personnel, doctors, surgeons, people with backgrounds in medicine, they typically tend to A, have enough money to fly from the coop first, to leave from a, a place of potential danger, to get out early. But in many cases, they also uh, intuitively, just by kind of the way they're trained and their global processes of thinking, they tend to see a little bit earlier that problems are on the horizon and they tend to leave anyway. Um, that is a problem for us because not everybody has a nurse, a doctor, an EMT in the family. But furthermore, in the event of a disaster, a grid down, some sort of breakdown in rule of law, you are looking at the very real possibility that not only are you going to have a limited amount of human factor knowledge because of population flight issues, but you're also looking at potentially, in the event of a grid down, having a substantial amount of your reference material utilized by medical professionals be gone as well. Because over the past few years, and I say this as a nurse who graduated in the early 2000s, over the past few years, we have shifted more and more away from hard copy reference materials to soft copy online stuff. For instance, with nurses, for those of you out there, you know that we have our, our references for our pharma pharmaceuticals. They're online in many cases. Um, you're looking for drug interactions, things like that. Your quick reference materials in many cases are online. They're on the computer. And if you're lucky, you'll have a nurse's drug guide somewhere in the nurse's station, but it may be a couple years old. Hopefully you've got a decent nurse manager to keep your stuff updated, but I'm not counting on that. So we have a limitation of our medical personnel. We have a limitation in hard copy resources, reference materials for personnel, um, but I'll even take this part a step further. The medical knowledge being limited is not just in personnel shortage. It's not just in a shortage of hard copy reference material. There also tends to be a shortage in functional, functional problem solving and in functional medicine outside of our standards we've trained to. I'll give you an example. In a hospital that I worked at a few years back, we were anticipating a major weather related disaster where we expected that we were going to lose power, the backup generators were going to kick on, but there was a chance that we wouldn't be able to get resupply for the backup generators. So what do you suppose happened? The nursing educator in the hospital went around to the units and had to retrain nurses, RNs, in the manual blood pressure obtaining methods, like stuff that you should know anyway. But I bring this to a point to focus for, for the following reasons. Many nurses, many healthcare professionals are used to relying on our technology, on our diagnostic equipment. We're used to relying on, on computer-based charting, computer-based um, risk assessment, risk management. In the event of a grid down, these standards that we've trained to, these procedures that we've accommodated, and the, the rules that we've taught not only our nursing staff, but our hospital staff, our healthcare providers to adhere to you know, for liability management, in many cases, that presents a specific problem because outside of that hospital-based support in a grid-down situation, the healthcare provider ends up having to take a whole lot on themselves, in many cases, to a standard that they're not trained to, right? Um, I'm thinking specifically of a case during Hurricane Katrina where there was, to my knowledge, only one nurse, one nurse at the Superdome, um, just remembering the, the news 
broadcast, one nurse at the Superdome who was basically in charge of thousands and thousands of people and of care for them. And, you know, was of course, because she was the only person there working, having to do things that, you know, you're taught in nursing school, bad, bad, you shouldn't do that. That's not within your scope. I'm not saying to be cavalier, of course, with these things. I'm not saying to, you know, to wantonly, you know, practice medicine without a license. But when you have a breakdown of rule of law, when you have anarchy, when you have grid down situations where you have no expectation of resupply, no expectation of law and order being reestablished soon, um, there is a mental handicap that comes with a lot of healthcare providers in the back of their mind thinking, I'm not trained for this. This is beyond my scope. All of this stuff. Well, you know, situations, disasters, they don't really care. No, what the circumstances do not care and they don't have any sympathy for for your lack of confidence in what you think you're able to do. And over the past, you know, couple hundred years, history is replete with journals of simple medical people, just simple people who ended up saving the day because they rose above their circumstances. But all in all, those are the three things that I want you to wrap your head around when it comes to survival medicine reality. Normal medical infrastructure is degraded or non-existent. Two, household medical supplies are scarce. And three, medical knowledge is limited. This is what I'm expecting. And this is what I base my preparations around. This is just a brief rundown of these things. We go in depth in class uh, regarding how to manage these risks, etc. But I just wanted to go over that with you guys today. I hope you enjoyed the video today. If you did enjoy the video, I hope you'll subscribe to me. You can also support me on Patreon. And uh, you can follow me on Facebook. I teach classes, folks, regularly, you know, and my four-day classes, which is Medical Prep 101, 201, and 301, are happening in Tennessee this year. So if you're interested in getting more information, you can definitely come out to class. But I do hope it was helpful for y'all, and I hope you have a wonderful weekend. For now, it's Patriot Nurse signing off, and I'll see y'all later. Bye.